Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I want to introduce you to a really interesting uh, uh, gentleman, author, uh, uh, who's written a, a really uh, interesting book called Mistaken Identity. Uh, he's an international keynote speaker. He's a mentor and a survivor of physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. Doug Dane has a unique perspective on personal growth and transformation. His personal experience has led him to develop a duplicable system to help others discover their true identity, let go of their past, and live a life of freedom. Wow. Doug Dane, welcome to the show. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> so tell me, what what's this book about, and why did you write Mistaken Identity? Well, the book is about uh, how we are uh, mistaken about um, how we see ourselves, our opinion of ourselves, our attitude towards ourselves, uh, also which leads to how we treat ourselves. Um, we grew up with uh, uh, a self-image. Um, most people have grown up with a low self-image, low self-esteem, inferiority complex, failure type personality. 60% uh, of people, adults, have gone through uh, some form of adverse childhood experience uh, like I have. That's uh, a big part of the population. Those are stats. Uh, it's probably bigger than that. And um, even people that grew up in a healthy home with healthy, healthy families and the parents stayed together and there were good people, uh, they still got this programming, rules, values, beliefs, biases, prejudices drilled into them and they were told who they were and who they weren't. They just sort of went with it, started living that way and followed a path and of course got results in their life that matched up with how they saw themselves. So your self-image, your opinion of yourself, that runs all your behavior, which dictates all the results you get in your life. And so I was very mistaken <clears throat> about who I was and who I wasn't because of what I endured as a kid. And so the reason I wrote the book was um, I, I wrote an article in the Toronto Star uh, in 2001. Uh, it was called Dark Past, Bright Future. And it was my my story, uh, my life story, what we're talking about here today. Um, it had been blocked out uh, for 39 years of my life. My marriage had failed and I went for counseling and the counselor, they asked these typical uh, family history questions and I couldn't answer much and she said I I think there's abuse in your background I go no there's not I remember my parents being drinkers and stuff and she said well if you're if you're if your life's not working very well and you want a better future you better figure out what happened to your past and so I did an investigation and I hired private investigators I met police officers I met social workers teachers family friends neighbors and I put this whole story together um, the, my adoption records, I got all this information. And then it explained why I felt so lousy about myself. Uh, I was very successful on the outside, but on the inside, I did not feel good. Uh, I had anxiety, depression, I was nervous around other people. Um, and uh, I was really suffering uh, internally. It showed up in health, of course. And so when I got the story came, I go, well, no wonder <laughs> I felt the way I've been feeling all these years. And I couldn't I'm a pretty bright guy. I was successful in business. I couldn't figure it out. And um, anyway, so of course, going public, it was on, I was on Canada AM and I was on a television show in Ontario. I was in books. People asked me to start speaking about it. And so when you go public with it, a lot of people go, they, they might migrate or, or come, you get attracted to you. And they go, how did you do it? And they go, how did you go from that story? Because it's very, it's a very dark story. It's a really good story. How did you go from that to being successful. And I couldn't tell you how to do it. I know what I did, but I couldn't show you how to do it. And then all these people I was talking to, and I'm and I was in the industry of you know coaching and mentoring people. And when I got to the real story, you know, they want to grow their business or change their career or fix their relationship. Uh, when I finally got to the truth underneath everything, that explained everything, just like for me, and they were set free pretty quick, like I was. And so I just, I had a heart to help these people. I knew I can only talk to one person at a time or in a group call. And I wanted to assemble what I did uh, in a duplicable system, but I've always been a walk the talk guy. I didn't feel the right to lay down uh, what I was doing until I had done it. And so it took me a while to kind of put it all together. And when I put it all together, I realized, man, this is so freaking simple. I made it so hard. I made it Take, it took way too long. And so the book, I never wanted to write a book, Brian, I, uh, uh, but there's a message in the book. This is the messenger. Uh, and it's not really a book you read. It's more of a guide or a handbook. I designed it in a way over 30 days, 
you write each chapter is only three or four pages long, about five minutes. And I use my story as leverage to get your attention. Um, I point you to a, a new idea. I'm trying to change your mind about what you think and what you believe about what's holding you back and what your problem is. And then I give you an action step. Very simple action step takes about five minutes. And the idea is to get you moving. I got to change your mind. I got to get your attention. I got to change your mind and then get you to do something while I've changed your mind. So then you start to see a, a reaction. So that was kind of the way I designed it. Sounds fantastic. Um, is it available on, uh, on online or? Yeah, uh, yeah it's available or everywhere. Get it? um, yeah, it's, uh, it, um, you can get it through obviously any of your online stores, um, Indigo or Amazon or Barnes, Barnes and Noble in the U.S. And it's in stores now. It just started shipping. So you can get it through your store or they'll order it. Um, or you go through my website, get it through there. If you go through me, then I give you a workbook. Uh, as well to go with the book. I mean, the workbook is basically what's in the book. We've just made a separate, you know, version that you can print out so you don't have to write in the book. So, how long did it take you to write it? Uh, <laughs> actually, physically to write the book, um, it didn't really take me. Probably took me less than three months, uh, really? end to end. But I've been writing in my mind for eight years while I was coaching uh, myself, uh, mentoring myself, and mentoring other people. And so like I wrote the title down eight years ago in my journal and it wasn't for a book title. It was go, I think, I think people have this mistaken identity. I think they're mistaken about how Who they, they see themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So. And, and how did you come to this realization that you had a mistaken identity? Well, just uh, really two, th well, three things probably. Um, the first real aha was, you know, the counseling after the marriage, marriage broke up that explained um, the story. And so uh, typically in that background, a lot of shame, uh, a lot of guilt, a lot of self-loathing. Um, when I went public with it, um, which was shortly after I had the whole story and I now understood it, there was a huge letting go. Like the negative feelings fell off. Like it was like brushing off my shoulder, you know, it happened really, really uh, fast. And and fairly quickly, I have like I have no negative association or feelings or emotions or any guilt, any resentment, any shame. I have nothing negative towards the experience. And I'm very open about it. So that happened really, really fast, you know. Um, and then um, it was that was 2001. And then it was another. Um, it wasn't until 2014. So you know, 13 years later, I was still carrying around this discomfort. You know, I was confident in a lot of areas, but still, you know, nervous and anxious in certain situations and, um, you know, up and down, dealing with typical, you know, stuff with our own mental wellness. And, uh, but I was, I started studying there, a guy who became a mentor and a friend, his name's uh, Bob Proctor. He's a Canadian. He's known all over the world. He, he passed about a year ago and he became my mentor and he taught me something um, that I did not know of because I never learned it in the corporate world um, that I have a, a gift. We all have a gift. It's called our mind and our mindset. Um, it actually directs our brain and nervous system. Now I didn't know that. And my brain and the nervous system weren't functioning optimally because I didn't feel good all the time. I was still making some mistakes. And so he started to teach me that I'm in control and I can direct this machine. And my mind is a machine. Uh, I am the operator. And so uh, in start, starting to study that, it started to uh, explain um, why I was in the physical or the emotional state I was. And so I needed to prove to myself that I was the guy creating my anxiety and depression, not the outside world. It was my reaction and perception to the outside world. And so that was a big turning point. And then I, I started to calm down. I became more relaxed. I became more confident. I became a more effective communicator like just it's a that the, the great quote by um, james allen calmness of mind is one of the beautiful jewels of wisdom it's the result of long and patient effort and self-control and i liked that idea i thought all right i'm going to take control of my mind and i'm going to direct it so that way my brain and nervous system operates more effectively and that was a huge turning point. And that's what I've been teaching for eight years. And, and so that, as I was teaching it, the, the great thing about teaching something is if you're a really great student and you're, and I was always a walk the talk guy. So I, I wasn't just going to be those, what do they say? Those that can't do teach. I wasn't going to be one of them. 
I was always a walk the talk. I, I want to do it for me, for my own betterment, but also I have a big heart to help other people. So I wanted to be a leader of guide. So I was going to do it so I could lead other people to do it. And so when you're, when you're learning and applying and teaching, your learning really accelerates. And uh, so now I'm just, uh, I think that everybody for the most part is stuck in a, in a prison, an emotional prison, and um, they got arrested because of a mistake identity. The real villain is their, is their upbringing and their condition, how they were treated as a child for a lot of people. And the key to the freedom lies inside. And I wrote this book as kind of a way to unlock the cell. And so I just want to get you out of jail. And then I want you to go down the hall and I want you to unlock all the other cells. And I'm just on this massive prison break is what I'm trying to, I'm trying to do so. Sounds like a great mission in life. We're going to take a break and come back uh, with Doug Dane in just two minutes. Stay with us, everyone. Fascinating conversation about uh, mistaken identity, his book. Stay with us. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. Uh, guest tonight is Doug Dane. He's an author, an international keynote speaker, a mentor, a survivor of physical, emotional, and sexual abuse who's written a book uh, called uh, Mistaken Identity. And it's a workbook on how we can figure out, it sounds like, uh, what, what went wrong in our, in our life and, and how we can change our mindset uh, to improve our life going forward. Uh, uh, Doug, I want to I read your book. It sounds uh, absolutely fascinating. And uh, I think we can all get it online at uh, wherever typical good books are sold or, or uh, a local bookstore. Um, Doug, I wonder... If you'd read something from yeah. from your book, maybe your story to give us a sense of what the book's all about. Yeah, sure. Well, I'll just, the book opens, the prologue is um, actually, it's called Dark Past, Bright Future. So I wrote um, an article, as I mentioned, in my life story. And so this is the this is the article that was in the Toronto Star, April 6, 2002. So I'll read a bit and just, just stop me if I go too long, but um, it's a few pages here. I won't go that long, of course. Um, all right, so here we go. Before I was born, uh, I was set up for abuse. Born in October 1963 to a woman who had already abandoned three children to the child welfare system, I was placed for adoption into an abusive environment. Ironically, I was placed by the Children's Aid Society, a sanctioned agency mandated to protect children. The placement could not have been more wrong. In a time when our national news is riddled with examples of childhood abuse, we should have the resources to provide guaranteed safe havens for children my story must be told. It's not good enough to shake our heads, pour out a small amount of disgust, and then move on to brushing our teeth before we turn out the light and forget. Stories like mine need to be placed before our consciousness until we, as a society, take responsibility, complacent aging bureaucracies, and understimulated consciousness must be revitalized before more lives are lost to physical or emotional death, crime, and the perpetuated cycle of abuse. The myth that we do all we can to protect children needs to be seen for uh, what it is. Um, and I could just hop to, I'll just hop to this part here. Uh, I was adopted as a six-month-old baby. The parents chosen me, chosen for me were both alcoholics. Relatives knew, friends knew. They'd also been approved for a child 18 months previously. He was adopted as a newborn and we became brothers. When I've gathered within the past year, it was the most rudimentary of home studies, yet it would have been simple to unearth that my parents were alcoholics and should never have been given the gift of one child, let alone two. Instead, case notes indicate my father was passive, but quite friendly and congenial, and that my mother lacked the social graces of a very feminine woman. This man whom the system turned into a father of two vulnerable boys abused not only his own body, but that of his equally abusive wife. This woman, whom the system turned into a mother, abused her body, her husband, and her two adopted sons. And every day was a ritual of abuse and survival, permeated by the stink of stale beer and cigarettes amid the squalor of a living room turned into my mother's bedroom. My dad had to have a lock on his bedroom door because my mom, drunk and violent every day, would instigate fights with him. The grind was the same. Get up, go to school, come home for lunch. We weren't allowed to stay in the safety of the school, no, filled with dread, what, light, what, what might lie ahead, we had to return to our mother at home. Then it was back to school and home again for more. That's kind of the, a part of it. I'm obviously sorry to hear this. Uh, but you say that you, you um, 
forgot it or, 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 or put it out of your head and, and didn't, didn't remember it until unearthed by, uh, by a therapist. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. How does that happen? Well, I think, uh, I mean, I'm no, I'm not a psychologist, but I, I think from what, obviously from I gathered and learned, um, it's very common for people that, uh, children that go through these adverse childhood experiences, they're defined as, um, emotional, physical, sexual abuse, witnessing violence or mistreatment or neglect. That's kind of the CDC's, uh, in the U.S.'s description of an adverse childhood experience or what they call ACE. And so I think it's very common um, for um, people to block out um, those uh, memories of, um, of violence. The sexual abuse, uh, I blocked all that out. I just, I remembered hanging out with my friend next door and we'd sleep out at night and I thought I was just trialing gay sex with a, another another boy you know um and so you just you it's very common to block these things out it's also very common to turn to coping mechanisms so at 15 when the abuse i was sexually abused for two years in a ring of pedophiles four different men and um that ended when i got kidnapped by one of them and when i arrived home the police arrive and do their investigation and after 15 then i I turned to drugs and alcohol to cope. And that was to, you know, of course, numb the sting and um, try to feel better about myself. So it's very common that uh, people will block memory out. In my case, it was, it was quite a bit. Um, I think when I, did, when I did give attention, I remember being in relationships and, and um, um, I, would, I would tell some stories about my past because I wanted to see if you would still accept me and like me given what I remembered I had been through. So there were stories I remember about my parents, you know, drinking and fighting, but uh, definitely not everything. And definitely when I got the police records, um, um, some of the memories came back, but it's still, a, I don't have a lot of memory about my childhood. Are you still in touch with uh, your brother? I am. Yeah. Yeah. He's, uh, he's doing well and he's uh, married and, and two uh, uh, grown children and uh, yeah, he's, he's doing well and did he have similar experiences? Did he have similar blocking out experience? What what was his story? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because when when the article first came out, he read it, he goes, I don't remember that. Um, and he has a much different uh, perspective on it. Um, the The result of that um, showed up for, you know, different ways for him in his life, especially in his in his marriage. And, and luckily, um, uh, they were able to weather it and, and uh make it work. And, and he's done really, really well now, but uh, he definitely, it presented as it does for all symptoms showed up differently, but he had a, he didn't have the same sort of view as I did. Um, it was interesting because I was called the little devil and he was called the little angel because I was born on devil's night, which is the day before Halloween in Canada. Uh, and my brother was born the day before Valentine's and he was called the little angel. And so I just took that on. I got into a lot of trouble. And so he was the favorite and he was the good little boy. And I was the bad kid and I was the bad little boy. You know? Were your parents or any of these other uh, pedophiles charged? Uh, my parents weren't. I mean, my dad, uh, I mean, my, my parents' marriage ended when I was 13. I, I, I called the police. I kicked my mom out of the house. She was beating my dad. They took her away and, and they left. My dad quit drinking at that point. Um, and, uh, my dad, of course, was charged many times with assault on my mom and, uh, but the pedophiles, yeah, there was, there was four of them that they found. I think it was the fifth one, but four were charged. There was, I don't know how many charges were laid, uh, against them. They got jail time, of course. Um, and it's interesting. Uh, one of the other ones, his name's James Nectel. He's in prison as a dangerous offender. Uh, when my article came out, it was a 13 year old boy. His mom saw my story in the kitchen of Waterloo record. And I interviewed, he wanted to meet me because he wanted to go public with his story. And uh, he was sexually abused by Nectal as well. And so, you know, uh, but luckily uh, this guy has been, been put away, you know? Um, so yeah, they were all charged and spent jail time. And uh, I tried to find the, the guy, Randy was the guy that mainly abused me. And um, I wanted to find out from him, uh, like what his story was. I, I, I hired a PI because I wanted to literally just meet him and give him a hug and tell him he's okay. Because at the time I was 13. It ended when I was 15. When he was charged, I thought he was this grown older man in my memory. He was 26 years old, Brian. 
he was just a young man himself, you know, and I figured this guy must have gone through something that caused him to do that. And with my awareness at this point in my life um, and having let go of all the negative feelings, I just wanted to see if I could help him. And uh, it's funny really? when I, you see- don't, you don't have, you don't have hatred and, and want revenge. You want to Nothing. help them. Oh, no, no, no. I want to help them. I mean, when I hear stories of child abuse, the first place I go to is, is the abuser. I go, I wonder, my heart goes to them um, first, actually. Because um, I, as a, as a former victim, um, I know that most children um, will and can be okay. Um, I don't minimize what happened to the child, of course, but I do consider the abuser for sure. Because it is a perpetual generational thing. I could have become an abuser, right? I could have become an alcoholic. I could have been statistically, I should be dead, homeless, or in jail, but I'm not, you know? And so. Okay. So what was the, what was the solution for you? What was the reason why you were able to survive after 15? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Uh, Of course, then I, I, I don't think I had any awareness, but looking back, um, I look at my adoption uh, as a good thing for two reasons. Um, I always knew that I was adopted from a, a very young age. And so I think unconsciously, uh, I obviously had some awareness within me. And I think, and I do remember thinking about this, that I'm looking at this situation and I'm, you know, I'm just, this is wrong, but I'm stuck there. And I think um, knowing I was adopted, I always thought um, I could end up in any home. I happen to end up in this home. If I ended up in a different home, you know, life would be different. So I was always imagining being in different homes and I'd stay at friends' homes and family homes because that gave me, you know, another home to kind of visualize. Um, So I think it just, there was something in me, obviously, that, you know, uh, kept a spirit in me, I call it, that kept, you know, driving me forward. Um, I got really good at surviving because I had to. And so I think um, that's a gift I got from my parents as well. In, in spite of what they did to me, it did build up a strength, a resilience, uh, a creativity, uh, great problem solving skills, great thinker. I'm a very uh, analytical, strategic, critical thinker. So I think it, it fostered gifts that I already had in me, even though it was a negative situation. And then um, I think the story is a gift, the adoption is a gift because I saved a little boy's life. Cause that could have been another little boy. Um, but I was able to survive and now thrive. Hmm. You say that, uh, all this, uh, childhood abuse negatively impacted your relationship and ended your marriage. Yeah. How? Well, I wrecked my marriage. I, let's just be clear. I wrecked all my relationships because I didn't have, uh, I had, I didn't have an example of a, of a healthy relationship but I've always had a big heart and I've always been a very honest, ethical person. Even when I was young, like when I was in my teens, all my buddies were, you know, screwing around on their girlfriends and and I always felt badly for them. I did a little bit, not as much, but I was I'm kind of looking, I go, this is wrong. And, and then I would do it. And I, I always I always felt um, deep sorrow, guilt and shame when I was doing that. But yet I was still like all of us, we do things we shouldn't be doing. Um, and so I just really struggled, but I, uh, uh, I was honest in every other area of my life, you know? And so I just pursued being a better person and kept attempting to do a better job in the next relationship, armed at the time with the awareness I had. So, you know, I'd already had many relationships and generally always long-term and then two marriages. And then, and every, my first two marriages, they literally lasted about a year. Because by that time, I got scared. I'm thinking, oh, they're going to figure out who I'm not. And they're going to leave anyway. So I better, I'll just, you know, I'll mess it up to get out of it. You know, and that was the pattern. And uh, so when the story came out of that, all right, I got to resolve this, you know. And uh, uh, that was uh, the next pursuit to be a better man, you know, be a better person. You would mess up your relationship because you knew that they would figure you out? That sounds yeah. like... Well, it's yeah, it's in the book. So um, I became a really good actor. Um, I didn't feel good about myself. So I would pretend to be somebody I wasn't in order to attract somebody into my life because I didn't really like myself or love myself. And so I figured 
I, I pursue relationships to get the validation and approval that I needed and wanted. Um, and so I was you know, drawn to that, what I perceived to be, you know, the safety of a relationship where somebody would love me. Um, but the problem in relationships is you can't pretend to be somebody you're not. You can't, you can't hide. And if you do, it, it causes problems. And so I just felt that's where I needed to be to feel good about myself. Um, and so to, to attract somebody, I pretend to be somebody I wasn't, so I wouldn't be myself. And then once you're in it, you can't hide yourself, your true self from the other person, you get in trouble. And, and, and this may not be explainable, but who were you trying to be and who were you? I was, well, I was trying to be a, a guy that had it all together, that was successful and confident and, uh, because I had become successful in business. And so people were seeing me a certain way and they would, they would, um, they would compliment me or they'd say things about me that were true in some respects, but I was not willing to accept that because I didn't, I didn't feel good about myself. So it creates this, this conflict. And so I was just, I was trying to pretend to be what others did see in me that I didn't feel was true. And um, uh, just trying to be that guy. And also, of course, you know, follow the paradigm, you know, get married, have children, be a father, raise a family, you know, be successful. Um, I guess I was pursuing a picture of what I wanted my life to be like. But at the same time, you were living a double life? Yeah, literally, literally living a, a double life. Um, certainly, for, for the most part, internal, because the internal dialogue was not how I was presenting myself on the outside. And that creates inner conflict and um, dis-ease, both emotionally and physically. So you say that uh, you think 60% of, uh, of people actually have troubled childhoods, have yeah. uh, some abuse in their childhoods. And so therefore, I guess your book is, uh, is needed by a lot of people. We're going to take a break. And, uh, and maybe when we come back, uh, Doug, you can talk a little bit about some of the things that you think people need to do um, if they come to the realization that they've got anything close to the challenges uh, uh, and, uh, you know, negative experiences in their childhood that, that you've had and or, you know, wherever they came from, uh, some of the depression or anxiety or other issues that people have and how your book and the, and the, and the exercises that you recommend can actually help people. Sure. Is that okay? Yeah. Love it. We're going to take a break. Two minutes. We'll be back with Doug Dean talking about uh, his book, uh, Mistaken Identity, and the exercises that he's suggesting that you follow to improve yourself. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio while we're on Saga 960. I'm having an interesting conversation tonight about childhood abuse and how it impacts you in your life and uh, what you can do about it. Uh, and my guest is Doug Dane. He's an author of a really interesting book called Mistaken Identity that we're going to talk about a little bit more in a minute. Uh, he's an international keynote speaker. He's a mentor. He's a coach. He's a survivor of physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. And he's uh, written this uh, book um, based on a developable, the development of a duplicable system to help others discover their true identity, let go of their past, and live a life of freedom, which is something I think all of us want. Uh, Doug, you, uh, you said in uh, what you wrote me that 60% of adults suffer from some form of adverse childhood experience. It, it seems like an astronomically high uh, statistics. I, 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 I shudder at uh, thinking about that. And that they continue to suffer in their career and at home and, uh, and, and, and they're raising children that then go on to suffer as well. So it's a generational uh, thing. Uh, they, you say, either can't let go of their victim mentality and they are very judgmental and critical towards their children or worse, the abusive behaviors perpetuate and the cycle continues. Yeah. This book that you've written, Mistaken Identity, you say it's got some, some exercises. Um, you tell the story and then you uh, uh, have people write some things down. How does this help people? What, what's the duplicable system that you've developed? Well, what I try to do is <clears throat> I, I kind of organize it somewhat um, chronologically. Um, I, uh, I, it's really in three stages. So what I learned from you know, my mentor and my work is we need to uh, learn, uh, unlearn, 
and then relearn. So what is your mistake? What is a mistaken identity? How did you get it? What is yours? That's the learn part. And then the second part of the book takes you through a stage is where I get, I, I start to get you to unlearn because you believe certain things. You were taught certain things. Um, you are locked into certain biases and prejudices and, and things around you and, and life and success and uh, mental well-being. There's a whole narrative around that that's so off track these days. Um, and so I try to change your mind. Um, and then the last part is um, the relearn where you start basically adopting your own new rules and standards. Like life is a game. Uh, it operates by certain rules. And if you play the game well, you're going to win. And nature operates according to certain principles. And uh, one of the reasons we don't feel good is we're not acting natural. We're out of harmony with nature. And so you need to make up your own rules and standards because they were just drilled into you as a kid. You just went with it. You made up more of yours along the way as you, you know, course corrected and fixed your life. And so you make up your own standards of operating and your own rules. And there are rules on how your mind works that very few people understand. And so if your mind directs your brain and nervous system and it's a machine and you're the operator, you better operate it the right way. Otherwise, you're going to, like any machine, it's going to get, it's going to have stress and it's going to seize up. And that's what's happening to a lot of people. Hmm. And then, so how do you, how do you solve it? How do you address this in your book? Uh, yeah. what, what are the exercises? Well, I'll give you an example. So uh, when I first got the idea of writing the book, um, really the biggest problem I see in the world that I want to really uh, do my best to minimize uh, and limit is judgment. The biggest problem we got in the world, I think the real pandemic is judgment. We judge everybody. We judge ourselves. Uh, it comes out in politics, it comes out in religion, it comes out through social media, it comes out of the news. It's Judgment is everywhere. Now, we were taught to judge. When we were born, little babies, we were born with just purely love and integrity. Um, judgment is operating out of integrity, and that's why we don't feel natural. So when we were little, we were judged. And it doesn't matter if you were, you know, went through what I went through, any normal family, when you were little... And you could start understanding, you saw the parents judging. They were judging each other. They were judging friends and family. And then they started judging you because you weren't following the rules. And if you didn't follow the rules, you got in trouble. And so they started judging you and measuring against measuring you against this bar that they had set that was handed to them. And very quickly, you took on the judgment and you started judging yourself. Now, the problem is, is that the rules, values, biases, all these things that were drilling into you, um, and you're watching the parents' behavior, what they're saying and doing, you're young, you, you, you felt like something was off track. You didn't know what the right track was, but you definitely felt like things were off track. Now, you didn't have the authority or power to speak up or do anything about it. And if you did, you got judged again. So you just, you kind of caved. And so um, we live with judgment. And, and uh, one of the other chapters I'll come to if we have time is, um, what's wrong with me? And so I kept saying that my whole life, what the hell's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? And my mom would go, Dougie Dane, what the hell's wrong with you? And um, a lot of people ask that question and I never got an answer. And the reason I never got an answer, because there's nothing wrong with me. What's wrong is what I believe. What's wrong is what I'm following. Uh, what's wrong is what I'm paying attention to. So stop judging. I realized the key to letting go of my own judgment was that judging was simply something I learned to do, and it was a habit. And so I just figured, all right, if I stop judging other people and I make that the habit, then I won't be judging myself. So it was my mentor that pointed me in that direction. He said, Doug, he said, if you stop thinking about yourself, you won't find anything wrong with yourself. Rather than turn your attention away from yourself and turn it to other people and just go help them you know, serve them, uh, make them feel good about themselves, make them feel like they're the most important person in the world, because as far as they're concerned, they are. And so I just turned my heart, because I got a big heart, and I just started helping people and loving people and seeing the good in people. And I just made my mind up, I'm going to stop judging other people and other things. Do I still judge? Of course I do. But I catch myself, because I don't like how it makes me feel when I judge you. And so that helped me to stop judging me, and now when people judge me, 
um, I'm somewhat immune. It doesn't really bother me when people judge me. And so the book is an obvious thing. The book is very wide open. And I'm not really worried about what you think about me, Brian. And so that, and so in the chapter, you know, again, each chapter is just a few pages. So at the end of the chapter, um, there's a, the, here's the action step. Your first step is to stop judging. Make a list of the things you judge yourself for. Pick one thing from your list. Decide you're going to practice letting go of it each day. Make a list of the people in your life whom you judge. Pick one person and decide that you are no longer going to judge them and practice starting today. As you practice the first step, pay attention to what you say and think to yourself about others and correct yourself. Look for the good in people. Treat others the way you want to be treated. And that is a good rule to follow. That's a great rule to follow. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you to step back uh, for a second, if I could. Uh, your statistic about 60% of adults have had some sort of abuse as a child. Yep. I, I find that astronomical. What have we done wrong as a society that's created that kind of upbringing of all of our children. You know, we, 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 we spoil our kids. We spend so much money on our kids. We have so much education. We do all these things for our children. How can it possibly be that 60% of them are abused? Well, I think, it, I think it starts in my opinion. I think, I think the whole psychology, uh, mental health thing got off track a long time ago, post-war commercialism starts and the whole psychology narrative went down a certain a certain road, a certain path. Uh, I've been studying for several years, really the science of mind studying older psychologists, uh, William James still, you know, considered the top 20 psychologists of all time. He was a Harvard professor. Uh, there was two things going on at the time. Um, there was a sort of mental science. People understood the mind and the brain and all that. And then psychology went in a different direction and commercialism just fostered, you know, keeping up with the Joneses and a compulsion for conformity, um, and then, of course, being raised um, with all this judgment, we were trying to fit in and just be liked and all that stuff. And so I think that's where it all sort of began, because the problems we're having today, we didn't have them like we have them today. You know, if you go back not too long in, in the past, now everybody goes, well, it's the current situation it's this and that. No, it's not. It's a lack of understanding of how. Uh, we are actually approaching our own mental well-being and our thinking. And so my answer to your question is, it's, it's judgment. Too many parents uh, are worried about whether uh, they're doing a good job or whether they're liked by their kids. That's one thing that's going wrong. Um, because of how we feel about ourselves, because of how we were treated when we were young, um, it shows up in um, our, uh, our emotions. So we we react, uh, we, are, we are angry, we, we act out, we're like children. I mean, I think a lot of adults, I was, um, we, it's called adult child syndrome. We live in adult bodies, but we're childish. We never really grew up. One of my chapters is grow up as adults. We need to grow up and take responsibility for our story and our experiences. Let it go because you're going to, you keep perpetuating this, these behaviors and these judgments and these, these criticisms and making your kids, you know, just feel unworthy. Um, I think that's one of the, the, the biggest issues. You remind me of a Seinfeld episode where, uh, <laughs> where uh, Seinfeld, Jerry and uh, George are uh, actually it's Jerry talking to Kramer about a conversation that we ha had with George. And they say, you know what? We came to the realization we're still kids. We haven't grown up. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that one. <laughs> We're going to take a break and come back true. with some concluding comments with Doug Dane and his book, uh, Mistaken Identity, in just two minutes. Stay with us, everyone. This is really kind of interesting. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. We're talking today with Doug Dane. He is the author of a book called Mistaken Identity that's all about uh, – about his story of uh, being abused as a child and how he learned to how he was resilient to get through that and how he learned to uh, to, uh, to to solve some of those issues uh, and move on in life and a system that he's developed that he thinks is duplicatable that is applicable for the rest of us and how to help uh, and he thinks that uh, and he quotes a statistic that sixty percent of adults have had some sort of abuse uh, as uh, children and so therefore 
he suggests that there's a lot of us that need uh, some help. Uh, and and this book, Mistaken Identity, is available uh, online uh, uh, through uh, booksellers, uh, your local bookstore, et cetera. Doug, when you were talking about your, your two marriages. Um, three. You said that, three, I apologize. Yeah. Um, <laughs> two, um, when, two when the story came out. And I had another one where I had my daughter and that one, I wrecked that one too. Um, I don't know if you said this exactly, but it sounded like you said that you cheated a lot. Um, yep. And I just, I, I, I hope this is okay, but I wanted to ask you, you know, why did you cheat and why do you think men cheat? Um, I now know uh, why I cheated. And I, in the book, I say I actually cheated on myself and cheated myself out of a better life because I cheated. Um uh, well, obviously, number one, uh, my uh, my model that I witness as a, a boy up until you know 13 years old, my mom left, was how my dad uh, not only treated my mom, um, but more importantly, what he was doing outside of the marriage. So he would bring girlfriends over to the house at our house while my mom is there. We would go with him, you know, on uh, day trips and traveled on a vacation with his his girlfriends um there's a story in the book that might shock some people but when i was a little boy my dad dragged my mom down to the basement um you know she's kicking and screaming fighting i'm crying and he grabs a shotgun out of the rafters of the basement he sticks it down my mom's mouth he said now that's how you treat a woman and so i saw you know a lot of things and uh, the cool what's interesting is i never ever hurt anybody or was ever physically uh, abused or mistreated a woman, which is kind of interesting given where I, I came from, but I think it's a testament that we're all, you know, individually unique. And um, so that was the beginning of it for sure. Um, and then um, for me, uh, it was again, back to this idea that um, I wasn't good enough. So I, I would find, I would meet wonderful people and they were kind and loving. And I thought I was in love and um, I, you know, Overall, it was a good relationship in some respects, but it was always this nagging feeling that I'm not lovable. I'm not good enough because I kept making the mistake that most of us make that we're taught to do is I kept reflecting on my past as a measurement or a gauge to predict my future. And so I always, if I look, you know, in the second marriage, looking back on the first marriage and all the cheating in between, you know, that was my um, uh, assessment of myself, you know? And so I just kept thinking, oh, I'm, you're probably going to screw it up again, Doug, and they're going to probably find out you're not this confident guy and all this dialogue in my head. And so then you start to justify um, somebody else. You, you pull away from the relationship because when you, when you get found in a relationship, you're trying to hide, you continue to try to hide. And as a little boy, I kept having to hide to stay safe. Um, and so I had to hide to stay safe in this relationship, which is really bizarre. And so I would pull away, we would disconnect, which is, would be fairly normal and a root cause of an affair. And then somebody else would hook my attention and I would go over there. And so I could get what I wanted over there, but then I could come back to the, the family and the relationship, et cetera, over here. So I think for me, that was primarily the, the driver of it, um, and I think the reason that men, it's not just men, it's interesting. I, one of my mentors, because I was really, you know, I was really hard on myself, of course. Um, and others, of course, would be hard on you, you know, in your family and, and friends when you do that. And uh, my mentor said, he said, Doug, do you know what causes affairs? And I never read up on it or studied on it, but I go, no. And he said, well, there's a great book. I can't remember the book. But he said, a woman wrote a book because they discovered it's not just men that cheat. Um, it's women cheat too. And so she wrote this book on eight different reasons why people have affairs. She goes, the marriage didn't fail because you cheated. You cheated because the marriage had failed. He said, your, um, your chapter in that book was stop this train. I got to get off. That was one of her models. Stop this train. I got to get off. And he explained because I didn't like where the train was heading. I didn't like the passenger on the train in some respects. We didn't really match up as well as I thought I did. 
but I was on the train and it was just going so fast and there's no way to get off. And so I jump off the train or I exit the train any station I could hop back on later because I was committed to be on the train. And uh, so that helped me to understand um, that, you know, my cheating was a result of, and so now I, uh, I completely forgiven myself. I'm very wide open to talk, but I have no secrets. Um, I forgive myself for all that because I have a good reason why I did it, but I was responsible to stop doing it ever again. So I will never cheat on myself again. And I will never cheat in a relationship again because it costs me too much. And, um, you know, it's not a so great way to So do you think you could have a long-term relationship or marriage today and not cheat? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Let me ask you another difficult question, if I could. You you, yeah. you said that uh, between 13 and 15, um, there were four pedophiles that were uh, abusing you. Um, you know, we've heard so much of late about uh, uh, religious figures that uh, have been pedophiles um, and that have abused people and, and educators and other things. Where do you think this comes from? Is, 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 are there some people that are genetically born with a desire to uh, be with young boys um, or is it because of, uh, of celibacy rules so that they're frustrated in other areas or it is it because they're homosexual and they don't feel like they can be homosexual and so therefore they got to find an outlet or is it because they were abused or you know what what what's the cause do you think of uh, of someone that wants to wants to be a pedophile or is a pedophile that's a whole other show <laughs> um I mean, I, I don't, I, I'm not qualified to give a, a specific answer. I just can give my, my opinion. I think you did list a number of the potential uh, reasons that that happens. I think, again, fundamentally for me, in, in my view, uh, I think uh, judgment and fear of uh, uh, being yourself, compulsion to conformity has been drilled into us and continues to be perpetuated in society. Uh, I think that causes us to hide a lot. Uh, I was out for dinner with a, a guy last night, and he was talking about his his uh, children, teenage children, and um, they were talking about he was talking about how um, a few years back, uh, one of the daughters felt she was transgender, and then now three years later, well, she's not, um, and so that's a very popular topic these days, you know. And I think what happens is just we're trying to figure out who we are. There's so much internal judgment, so much external influence um, more than ever before through these phones and internet and social media and stuff that um, I think it's, you know, even this, they, they call it, what do they call that cancel culture or something like that? Like there's all this external pressure um, and you're trying to figure out who you are. And then of course, there's a lot of, I don't think we're going to eliminate child abuse. Um, I'm hoping to try to breed it out. Meaning that if I can get an adult, or a kid like me who became an adult to sort his life out, who then raises a daughter, she's now 20, to let go of all that junk and set her up well so she's happier and healthier and then she has children. Maybe in a couple of generations we can minimize all this, but I don't think you're going to get rid of it. Um, I, think, I think our world's in, a, in rough shape because there's so much external noise and, and anger and things going on. But I think you hide more than ever. I think people hide more than ever, but they don't stop their behavior. Doug Dane, mistaken author of Mistaken Identity. Thank you so much. This has been a really uh, interesting, thought-provoking uh, hour, and uh, and I look forward to reading the book. Um, I think that uh, you've got a, uh, a unbelievable background. Like, oh my God, I can't believe that uh, you experienced it all. And I'm very sorry for that, but it sounds like it's made you who you are today. Um, and, um, and you've got and shown the resilience to get through it. And now you want to turn that into a positive and help other people. And so Absolutely. that's, uh, that's a, a great passion and a great mission in life. And so I thank you for that. My pleasure. Thank you. Stay in touch. That's our show I for will. tonight, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I remind you, I'm on every Monday through Friday at 6 o'clock on 960 AM. You can stream me online, even from Guelph, at www.saga960am.ca. All my podcasts and video casts are available on my website, briancrombie.com. The videos are on Instagram, Facebook, uh, YouTube, LinkedIn, etc. And the video, uh, sorry, the podcasts are on, uh, on, on Speakeasy and SoundCloud and Audible and Apple. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night, everybody. Good night.